Discouragement is one of those human emotions that pretty much everyone can relate to. And when it comes, you may find it hard to describe, you may find it hard to explain, but nonetheless, when it comes, you kind of know it's there. You're like, okay, that's discouragement. If you had to describe it, you might say, well, it feels like being downcast. It feels like being disheartened. It feels like somebody took the wind out of my sails. It feels like I got punched in the stomach. It feels, to use a maybe technical term, blah. (laughs) I feel blah. Everybody knows, I think at some level, what it feels like to be discouraged. Put it another way, when people feel discouraged, oftentimes they feel like they want to give up. Someone's discouraged, they often feel like that. They could ask questions at some point, like, what is the point? Why am I even doing this? Why? Why even go through these motions? Why go through the service? Does it matter? Is it affecting anybody? Is it doing any good? Is it having any impact on people's lives? Is it making any difference? It seems so meager, so small, so useless. What's the point of what I'm doing? People can feel that way. Encouragement. When you feel encouraged, it usually brings with it a sense of energy, and enthusiasm, whereas discouragement usually brings with it a measure of dejection, a kind of loss of enthusiasm. This feeling isn't foreign to God's servants. As a matter of fact, Charles Spurgeon, in his work, Lectures to My Students, actually included a chapter called The Minister's Fainting Fits. So that his students, a chapter or a lecture called The Minister's Fainting Fits, because he wanted his students to know this is kind of part and parcel, by and large, of a life in ministry. You will experience that. You will experience some measure of despondency. Spurgeon himself noted that he knew, he said, quote, by most painful experience, what deep depression of spirit means. He also went on to describe Luther. He said the life of Luther might suffice to give a thousand instances. And he was by no means of the weaker sort. But examples aren't limited to just the extra biblical realm. You go through the scriptures and you find people dealing with discouragement quite a bit. You go through the Psalms and you'll find this psalmist or that psalmist at times dealing with discouragement, feeling downcast. Look at the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 20, uh, verse 14, he said, Cursed be the day on which I was born. You know you're pretty discouraged when you say that. He went on and he said in the rest of that verse, The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. What about the prophet Elijah? He knew what it was like to be discouraged. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14, he said to the Lord, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Even the Messiah, the servant of the servant songs of Isaiah, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, speaking through Isaiah, communicated an awareness of that sense of discouragement prophetically through Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 4, we read, this is the servant of the servant songs, that suffering servant speaking through Isaiah. He said, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. See, during the Messiah's first coming, we know according to John chapter 1, verse 11, but the Gospels bear this out as well, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to the Jewish people and he was by and large rejected. But he spent his strength, he labored, he taught in their synagogues, he healed, he preached, he labored much. He taught in synagogues, in the open field, in homes, and along the way. And in those days of his labor, there was little fruit in comparison to the size of the nation. And so here we even find in Isaiah 49 verse 4 that the Messiah knew a sense of discouragement. Don't forget, according to Isaiah 53, it comes a little bit after Isaiah 49, we know that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew that sense. But notice here, if you were to look at Isaiah 49 verse 4, that non-sinful feeling that he felt was quickly restrained and subjected to the assurance that his labor and work would be rewarded by God. Even before the Incarnation, you might say, the Messiah modeled for his people how to handle discouragement. He left the matter with his Father, and he smothered despondency with the trust that God, in due time, would render a reward for the service that 
he undertook and the labor that he did. I do think that servants of Christ, just as a quick exhortation right here at the beginning, I would say let the servants of Christ follow the example of the chief servant and be encouraged, knowing that if you spend your strength in doing the work of God, you spend your energy in laboring for Christ, your strength is not spent for nothing. Your work doesn't go unnoticed. Your heavenly Father who sees in secret sees it, whether it's secret or whether it's open. And your labor, to use language from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, is not in vain in the Lord. On the builders in the temple, the builders of the temple in the days of Haggai, they knew what it was like to experience a sense of discouragement. They knew what it was like to have bouts with discouragement. But there was good news for them, even as there is good news for us. The God that we serve is, as Paul identified him to be in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, the God of endurance and encouragement. And you're going to see on display in the text today, and you'll see it, Lord willing, next week as well, the God of encouragement meeting his people in the midst of their discouragement. That's who he is. He's the God of endurance and encouragement. As we make our way into the text, let's first create a little bit of context. The Lord, do not forget this, in an act of kindness. Remember, nobody filled out the prophet request form in the days of Haggai. They weren't saying, you know, we just want to hear how God would rebuke us for our indifference to his work. They didn't do that. God, in his grace, sent the prophet Haggai to them, to Zerubbabel, to Joshua, and to the remnant of the people for their misplaced priorities. Working on their homes and making a living took precedence over the work and the worship of God. And just to remind us, it's good for us to be reminded, we're not immune to the kinds of excuses and then some that the people in Haggai's day made, right? Just think about it. Throughout the course of a given month, there could be so many excuses why we would put the work and worship of the Lord on the side, on the periphery. We might say, well, I have work, or she has a recital, or he has a game, or we have a party, whatever it is. And then, you know, a whole month goes by and the work and worship of the Lord is put on the periphery and we find ways to justify our excuses. To f we find ways to say, no, there's good reason for the propensity to perpetually be putting the work of God on the periphery and building my life around so many other things instead of building my life around the worship and the work of God. Well, God in his grace was not going to leave the people like that. He called the people to get their priorities in order. He called them to set themselves to undertake the task of rebuilding the temple and remember what happened. They, he they heard him. They obeyed. They feared the Lord and they obeyed the Lord. Joshua, Zerubbabel, and all the remnant of the people they got to work. They went to the mountains. They procured timber. They prepared. They made the necessary preparations for building the temple. And then 23 days later, after they immediately began to obey and went up to the mountain and got the timber and so on, then they began to rebuild the temple. But they feared the Lord and they obeyed. You know, their reaction reminds me of a story that I had read um, this week. In one of the books that I'm reading, there was a story about um, technical sergeant Richard Redding. He was um, stringing wire on a telephone pole in Sicily in 1943 when the Allies were engaged with um, the Nazis in a fierce battle. And as Redding was working on this, basically a much-needed communication line, the general that he was serving under, the lieutenant general, George Patton Jr., yelled up to Redding. Because at that point in time, interestingly, Nazi aircrafts were strafing. They were kind of diving and then issuing fire on those allies who were on the ground. And um, Lieutenant General George Patton Jr. yelled up to Redding and he asked if he wasn't afraid of those diving aircrafts. And then uh, Technical Sergeant Redding said, yes, sir, <laughs> as though to affirm, I am afraid of them. And then his lieutenant general said, then why are you up there? And he responded by saying, because I'm even more afraid of you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it can work that way with the Lord. We can undertake difficult tasks that are risky, that are arduous, that are even dangerous, because we fear dishonoring the Lord more than we fear the consequences of taking that action. And that's where the people were. We saw that in chapter 1, that they feared before the face of the Lord and they obeyed. 
So they got to work. But as is often the case when you said about God's work, and you know this by experience probably, that you can leave church on a Sunday morning, leave corporate worship on a Sunday afternoon, and then you could feel fired up. And maybe you feel fired up Sunday night. Maybe you even feel fired up on Monday. Maybe you even feel fired up on Tuesday. But then maybe around the middle of the week, sometimes before, sometimes a little bit later on, all of a sudden, sometimes inexplicably, you start to feel discouraged for one reason or another. You felt like, after hearing the word of God proclaimed, after worshiping with the people of God, you felt like you were running downhill with the wind on your back. You felt energized. And then all of a sudden, Tuesday comes, sometimes for people Sunday nights, sometimes for people a little bit later on, maybe Friday, you feel like you're walking uphill with the wind in your face, and you become weary. You're like, should I keep doing this? Is there even a point to this? Well, the people of God in the days of Haggai, they knew what that was like. It appears that the remnant was facing that kind of thing when again the God of encouragement reached out to them and brought them a message through the words of the prophet Haggai. We begin in Haggai chapter 2, verse 1, where we read, On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, So we'll stop there just to create some important context. The word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai on the 21st day of the seventh month. Now, the date for this oracle is often um, said to have been October 17th, 520 B.C. Just to give you a little bit of context, that means that this came about six weeks after Haggai's first prophecy that opened up this book, approximately, or some date, August 29th, and that this prophecy came a little less than a month after the people began to resume rebuilding the temple. Now, although the people set about to do the work of the Lord, the seventh month was a busy month, uh, or a month of feasts, where a lot of work would be set aside for Sabbaths. Not just the regular Sabbaths, but Sabbaths that would accompany feast days. The seventh month in the Jewish calendar, Tishri, was st it started with a celebration of the Feast of Trumpets. So that happened on the first day of the seventh month. And then on the 10th day of the seventh month was the Day of Atonement. And then on the 15th day of the seventh month began the Feast of Tabernacles. That was a seven-day celebration. At the first day, there was a holy convocation when no work was to be done. And on the eighth day, there was a holy convocation in which no work was to be done. But it was a seven-day feast. And interestingly enough, it's on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles that the word of the Lord comes through the prophet Haggai. And it would be an interesting time for the word of the Lord to come to the people. Solomon's temple, as it's often referred to, was dedicated during the Feast of the Tabernacles. Interestingly, that was a time when the Jewish people would live in tents. They would live in booths to recall the way in which God brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness and sustained them in the wilderness. It was a way in which that act of God taking his people in the wilderness out of Egypt would be commemorated and that future generations would know that he had done that. It was also a time when Israel would celebrate the ingathering of the harvest or the ingathered harvest. Now, if you put all those variables together, there were a lot of reasons for the people of Haggai's day to be discouraged. You might think during the Feast of Tabernacles, there everybody is to worship and they're remembering Solomon's temple was dedicated on the feast of tabernacles, during the Feast of Tabernacles. And that temple was a lot more glorious than the one we have in front of us. They might also be thinking in times past during the Feast of Tabernacles, people will be celebrating the ingathering of the harvest, but yet remember, according to Haggai 1, their harvest was very meager. They didn't have much. There would be quite a few reasons why the people might have been discouraged. It was supposed to be a festival that was commemorated with joy, Leviticus 23, verse 30. But the people... In this, if you will, this second exodus out of Babylonian captivity, they didn't have the wonders accompany their journey back to Jerusalem that the people had accompany their exile from Egypt. So they possibly had a lot of reasons to be discouraged, at least in their minds. And so the Lord in his grace was going to speak to them. So the word of the Lord came by, the, by Haggai the prophet saying, and we look at verse 2, in verse 2 we're told, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, and before we get to the message itself, 
notice the people that God is addressing this message to. It's not just Zerubbabel this time, and it's not just Joshua. Remember earlier, he addressed them first, and then by extension, the people were to hear the message. But now he includes the remnant. He wants all the people who had set about to do the work that he had called them to do, he wanted them to hear this message as well. As one writer said, God wishes them, therefore, to hear his gracious words directly, not through the mouths of their leaders. So God wanted all the people to hear this word of encouragement. But before the word of encouragement comes, notice three questions come. Verse 3, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? The first thing I want you to notice is that the Lord does not hide from reality. He confronts it head on. He knew what was on the people's minds, and he addresses it. The people were discouraged because they're looking at that temple that they're building. I mean, they haven't been at it all too long, right? They had laid the foundation some years back. They got back to work. They're working on it for maybe close to a month, less than that, when you even think about the Sabbaths that they had to take off. So they haven't been working on it all too long, but they're discouraged. They're looking at the temple, and they're thinking, either having heard about Solomon's temple from other people or some who saw it with their own eyes, are looking at this work that they're doing, and it seems like nothing to them. And God doesn't hide from it. So he starts asking them questions. Who among you, who was left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? In other words, there were people who saw the former temple and they were discouraged even as they had been years earlier. Remember, when the foundation was laid years earlier, people began to weep at the difference between the temple and its foundation being laid then and Solomon's temple years earlier. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 12, we're told that many of the priests and Levites, and heads of the father's households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes. So you might remember in Ezra 3, when the foundation was laid, that there was a mix of weeping and rejoicing. It was hard to tell the difference between the two. But who were the people that were leading the way in the weeping? It was the people who saw what the temple was like years back before it was destroyed and burnt to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar's forces, 2 Kings 25, verse 9. So the Lord asks them, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? Two things to note right there. There's a continuity between the temple that was destroyed and the temple that they were rebuilding. Who saw this temple in its former glory? So there was a sense of continuity. Second thing I want you to notice is that he uses that word glory. And the word glory it can give you Old Testament references. It could refer to material splendor, or it can refer to the presence of God. Doubtless, the people thought that this temple lacked both. It lacked the material splendor that Solomon had, the resources. Yeah, e even with the help of, um, of Darius and, and so on, it couldn't compare to what Solomon had and what David had helped Solomon amass. It lacked the material splendor. And we don't have any signs that the fire, the Shekinah glory that accompanied that first temple and its dedication was found, at least at this point, in this um, rebuilding process. Now, there's much more that could be said about that. You can wonder what went through the people's minds. The dimensions might have been a little bit bigger if the people followed Cyrus's, um, uh, Cyrus's decree. And you could look at language in um, Ezra chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. But again, the same resources weren't available to the people. Uh, they could have thought a lot of things, but here's the problem, and here's the application for us. Looking back to the past was skewing their view of the present. They were rebuilding a temple that was going to be far more glorious than they knew, but they couldn't see it. Their view of their present work was obscured by their beholding the past. Appearances can be deceiving, and in fact, they not realizing it, they were deceived. At face, value, at face value, they were right to say, this does not look anything like Solomon's temple, or this doesn't look like anything that I heard Solomon's temple looked like. This does not look glorious. This does not look magnificent. And so at face value, they were right, but appearances were very deceiving. They thought probably, this work seems so meager. It seems so unimportant. It seems so paltry compared to what was undertaken years back. Why are we even doing this? But they didn't realize that they were undertaking a process, they were undertaking a building endeavor 
that was going to be far more glorious than they realized. Here I think we're reminded of an important principle. We ought to avoid making unhealthy comparisons to God's work in the past, lest we minimize the significance of God's work through our lives in the present. Doubtless, there are those in the church today, maybe even in this building, who have become demotivated, perhaps even self-sidelined, because they have thought that either their current work or their prospective current work couldn't compare with what they had done years back, so they've become demotivated and self-sidelined as a result. They say something like, what I did before for the Lord was glorious, and is this current work or prospective work as nothing in his eyes? Therefore, what's the point? There might be those who look in church history and get discouraged because they say, I look at the work in years past that saints did, and is my work as nothing in the eyes of God? It's so meager. Look at Luther translating the Bible from, you know, from, from, from the Greek and into German and working from the Hebrew and translating into German. I look at Whitfield preaching multiple times, not a week, but a day during the Great Awakenings. And I start to think, what, is, what am I doing? It's so meager. It's so paltry. And you become demotivated. You become self-sidelined because you're making unhealthy comparisons with the past. And it's leading you to minimize the significance of your work in the present. See, the people couldn't see it. It looked meager. It looked like nothing in their eyes. Yet, God's going to make a point to them a little bit later on. We'll see this Lord willing next week. They were building something far more glorious than they realized. God told them, this temple is going to be glorious. I'm going to fill it with glory. But they couldn't see it. So I want to encourage you, please, do not think your work unto the Lord is insignificant. Don't make an unhealthy comparison with the past and say, I used to do all this, and what I'm going to do now, or what I have done now, it's as nothing in his eyes. You don't know the ripple effects of God's work through your life in the present. There may be a noticeable difference between your work in the present and the work done in the past, whether it's your own or others. But that doesn't mean your work is not significant. This is a great illustration of this. The builders in Haggai's day, they were building something far more glorious than they realized. We'll see that in verses 6 through 9. You lack, and I lack, not only the vantage point of the future, but the vantage point of God. Your role may be a God-appointed link in a chain that extends beyond your ability to see. And doubtless it is. You think of that unknown preacher who preached that day when, when uh, Spurgeon had worked, walked into the church, and he preached from uh, Isaiah 45, verse 22, look to me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Man, man labored, prepared a message. Little did he know that there would be somebody who would be mightily used by God to preach to thousands and thousands who would be saved under the preaching of the word in his ministry. Your work may have ripple effects. Doubtless it will, far beyond what you realize. Your faithfulness in the present to do whatever you can to participate in the building of the Lord's church is your offering to him. Its preciousness is found in that alone. But nonetheless, the ripple effects of that offering is his prerogative. So be encouraged. But there's more about that. The remnant was discouraged in light of those kind of comparisons. And look what the Lord told the people through Haggai. That encouragement that I'm giving you, we're going to see that more so in verses 6 through 9. Because he's basically going to, going to tell the people, look, there's a lot more going on here than what you see. You see something that looks meager and it looks kind of unimportant. It, it just looks like it just falls far short of the glory that you were hoping to, to, to see here. It's far more glorious than that. But you just don't see it right now. That comes a little bit later on in verses 6 through 9. What we're going to hone in on now for our remaining time is the encouragement that God gave the people in verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, he tells the people, But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord. So God's encouragement began with a thrice-stated encouragement, charge, take courage. More literally, be strong. The Hebrew word that's used there for take courage speaks of fastening upon, seizing upon, being firm, being resolute. Could even speak of conquering. 
It's as though God was telling the people who were becoming discouraged by what they saw with their eyes, becoming disheartened, dispirited in the work. It's as though he told them, get a grip. Don't stop. Be strong. Lay your hands upon this plow, as it were, and push on. Go forward. Don't pull back. Push forward. Seize the calling which is before you. It's as though the Lord was charging people in that way. Now, you know your work is not insignificant if the God of heaven and earth is telling you to do it. (laughs) That in itself should say there is significance in this. The creator of heaven and earth is calling me to do this work. Now, look at the people that he identified here. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor. He needed to take courage and do the work that he was called to do. He needed to keep leading. He needed to keep providing direction and governance to the people. And doubtless the people, seeing his leadership, seeing him undertake his calling, would feed off of that. Joshua, the high priest, was told to take courage and do the work that he was called to do. He had a holy calling, one that reinforced the reality that Yahweh is a holy God and that he was among his people and that his law was to be observed. Joshua, the high priest, needed to walk in that example and he needed to take courage and do the work. And all the remnant of the people, instead of sinking in the mire of despondency, lamenting comparisons that they had either seen or heard of, God tells them, take courage, be strong, seize upon your calling, seize upon the task before you, and work, work, do the work that you've been called to do. God had conferred upon them this gracious gracious privilege, this gracious calling, and he's basically telling them, work work. Don't forget the motivation of Haggai 1.8, so that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. But they would be edified in the process, and future generations would be blessed as well. More can be said about that, and will be, Lord willing, next week. See, I want to encourage you, because discouragement uh, will tell you to set aside the work of God. You're going to experience it. You probably know. You may have experienced it this week. You may have experienced it this morning. You may have experienced it sometime today. Discouragement will tell you, set aside the work of the Lord. But I just want to remind you, and it's good to know this, that discouragement does not relieve you or I of our responsibilities as a Christian. That in itself is just helpful. Because if we think every time that we're discouraged, it's a legitimate excuse to say, you know what, now it's time to take a break from the work of the Lord. Now it's time to set ourselves aside for a while. We are deceived. God's telling the people, no, you're discouraged. I'm not telling you to go take like, you know, a six-month vacation, you know, remnant of the people, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Work, take courage. Don't let despondency and discouragement and dispiritedness stop you. Stay about the work of the Lord. That's what God's telling them. I find that tremendously helpful. Unhealthy comparisons between the present and the past, yes, it can make your present or prospective labor seem inconsequential. You may wonder whether it's going to have any impact on anyone or is having any impact on anyone or anything, but you don't have to try to figure all of that out. You lack the vantage point of God. You lack the vantage point of the future. Your prerogative is to take courage and work. And if you need some New Testament counterparts to that, you have a bunch of them. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. And you know if you don't grow weary in well-doing, God promises in due time, if you faint not, not, there will be a harvest. You know, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, that you and I are called to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing what? What the people needed to know then, that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, right? Paul telling the Corinthians, quit ye yourselves like men and be strong. There's a lot of New Testament counterparts to this kind of exhortation that we're seeing right here. But notice, there was a grounds for the exhortation. God isn't just telling the people, and this is so like God, we see this so often in the scriptures. He's not just telling the people, take courage and do the work because I said so. That that would be enough. Like, yes, we got it. You're the creator. We're the creature. We should just take courage and do the work because you said so. But he gives them a rationale, a grounds upon which to undertake this continued work. Namely, the blessed reality of his abiding presence. He told him to take courage and work, and here's the rationale, for I am with you, declares the Lord. What a promise. You know, I fear sometimes that for us, that we could look at that and be kind of unimpressed by that. And we know he's with us. I know that. Is, is, there, is there additional motivation that I have? Success. Fruitfulness. You know, 
people liking the work that I'm doing? Celebration on behalf of others. Is there something else you can give me? As though we could be unimpressed with this amazing promise. Take courage and work, and here's your motivation. I'm with you. Let it be known that that's the greatest motivation to undertake the work of the Lord. If we start to think like that, we have like a Moses, Exodus 33 kind of mindset. Like, I don't want to go unless your presence is going with us. Why? Because your presence makes all the difference. If you are with me, I know I don't need to be afraid. I may be afraid, but I know I don't need to be afraid. And if you're with me, that means whatever you're calling me to do is going to be empowered by you. Therefore, I can undertake the task that is before me. Even if it seems daunting, even if it seems like a mountain that will not be moved, I can undertake it because you are with me. What a motivation. You know, this was the instruction and the rationale for heeding um, the building of the temple, essentially, that Solomon had given, that David had given to Solomon. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20, we read, Then David told his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for your service of the house of the Lord is finished. It's the same kind of idea here. Be strong. Do the work. The Lord your God, a remnant, he's with you. And he will not fail you or forsake you until your work is done. He will make sure that you finish the calling and the task before you. Same kind of instruction. Similar is instruction that God gave to Joshua when he told him three times, be strong and courageous. Um, Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, we read, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, the key variable for success an accomplishment, and courage for continuing and not giving up is found in the presence of the Lord. It's found in the presence of the Lord. Stephen Cole uh, shared a, a great example of this, uh, referencing the missionary to Africa, David Livingstone. Um, David Livingstone, who had worked doing ministry for many years in uh, the heart of Africa, Afterwards, he received an honorary degree from the University of Glasgow, an honorary uh, doctorate. And on that occasion, he is said to have said, Would you like me to tell you what supported me through all the years of exile among people whose language I could not understand and whose attitude towards me was always uncertain and often hostile? It was this, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. On those words, I staked everything, and they never failed. See, the promise of God's abiding presence, it's not only good for someone like Joshua, it's not only good for someone like Solomon, it's not only good for uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the remnant of the people. It's a promise that is good for every one of you, every one of you who are in Christ Jesus. Be strong and do the work that God has called you to do, for he is with you. Now, this was meant to encourage the people, and the Lord reinforced this encouragement in the following verse. In verse 5, we read, As for the promise which I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Again, appropriate time for the people to be reminded of their deliverance from Egypt, their exodus from Egypt, and their wilderness um, wanderings. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the seventh day of the feast. And God here was reminding them of the covenant that he had with the nation when he brought the nation out of Egypt. The idea of verse 5 is essentially this. The same God who is among his people post-Exodus and amidst the wilderness was in the midst of this post-exilic remnant. His spirit was abiding with the people and they needn't fear. 
I think T.V. Moore um, put it well when he said, as this covenant had never been repealed, at least up until that time, to despair of God's blessing when obeying his command was to give God the lie. In other words, they were doing what they were supposed to do as part of the old covenant. They were undertaking the work that they were meant to do, and God had promised that he would be with them in that work. They were to be his people, and he was to be their God. He had made a covenant with them when he brought them out of Egypt. And that covenant was not annulled. The new covenant was not enacted at that time. And they were to be encouraged that his spirit was among them. They didn't see the pillar of cloud. They didn't see the fire by night. No, they didn't have that. But they had the word of his promise. I'm with you. The language here is interesting as a little bit of an aside. You read in our text, uh, as for the promise which I made, uh, made you, could be rendered more literally, as for the word which I cut with you. That uh, euphemism cut is often used with relationship to making a covenant. You might think of Genesis 15, for instance, when the, the sacrifices were cut in half and then the, um, the Lord passed through the sacrifices. It was a way of saying when you cut a covenant, let this happen to me, what happened to these sacrifices, let it happen to me if I do not fulfill my part of the covenant. And God was reminding the people, I made a covenant with you. And they were fulfilling their old covenant part of it and he had promised them that his spirit was in the midst of them. No, they didn't have the pillar of cloud or the fire by night, but they nonetheless had his presence. And they were to work, and they were not to fear. Now, as we close today, I do want to um, ask this question and seek to answer it so as to encourage you. How do you stay about the work that God has called you to do amidst discouragement? I would, be, I would be bold enough to say that every one of you, if you seek to undertake the work of the Lord, you will be discouraged at some point in it. As a little bit of an aside and a, and a little bit of a, a little parenthetical not, thought here, if you are not undertaking to serve the Lord, you should be discouraged by that. <laughs> and say, what am I doing? God, so if, if you believe the gospel, if you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins, if you believe the Son of God laid down his life for you, he gave his life so that you would be secured and forgiven of your sins forever, having eternal life, you should ask yourself, what in the world am I doing? If I profess to know Jesus Christ as Lord, yet I serve myself as though I'm Lord. I serve other things as though they take preeminence over him. So there should be a sense of, you know, at least for a moment, discouragement that leads to repentance and then by God's grace, action to say, no longer. But for those who are undertaking the work of the Lord, you will become at some point discouraged. And I think this passage speaks to what we ought to do. Uh, for starters, I want to encourage you to say this. And it's a little bit of a review of some things I've said, but maybe with some different nuances here. For starters, you keep going. So what do you do when you feel discouraged? You keep going. Where am I getting that from? Haggai chapter 2, verse 4. The people were discouraged, very discouraged. So you know what the Lord told them to do? Take courage, do the work. See, if you take quitting off of the table, you're helped. But if it's an option that dangles before your face over and over again, I'm going to sideline myself, and I'm just going to like not do the work of the Lord. I'm not going to be about the work and worship of the Lord. I'll take a break from church for a few weeks and so on, or whatever it might be. Don't do that. Don't do that. You don't excuse yourself from obedience. You don't resign because you haven't received or haven't seen the results that you've hoped for. Interestingly, there are, there are a lot of parallels, even chronologically, with um, the book of the prophecy of Zechariah. And in Zechariah um, chapter 4, the Lord tells them not to despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. More about Zechariah 4 in a moment and God's word to Zerubbabel in um, Zechariah 4. You are to be strong and do the work. Some New Testament examples of this, uh, of this encouragement. Think about Jesus in this parable of the, the, the minas or the minas. In Luke chapter 19, verse 13, we remember that Jesus had told his servants, essentially in the parable, but by extension it's an application for us, do business till I come. He's not here yet, and you're not there with him. So work. Be about his business till he comes. Christ's servants are not to say, my master is delaying his coming, to use language from Matthew 24, verse 48. Rather, they are to be those wise servants who are found faithful, Matthew 24, verse 46. To put it another way, one more time for now, according to the exhortation in Haggai's prophecy, 
take courage, and work. Second, work knowing that God's presence and God's spirit will empower you to accomplish what he's called you to do. Getting that right from Haggai chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. Yes, you are to be strong, right? Let's, let's give a little bit of new covenant context here to the, that encouragement. Take courage or be strong and do the work. You are to take courage. You are to be strong. But how are you to be strong? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in what? In the Lord and in the power of His might. Same principle for them in that day too. It was in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. You know that popular verse that we know? Not by might. Not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know who that was spoken to? Zerubbabel, the governor. To Zerubbabel, the Lord said. What before him was a mountain, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. But by the Lord's grace, it was going to be made a plain. This mountain was going to be made a plain. He was going to be able to accomplish the work, not by his might, not by his power, but by the spirit said the Lord. And so it is with you. You may feel discouraged. You may feel like, I can't do this job of parenting the way God has called me to do it. I can't be the husband or the wife that God's called me to be. I can't be the persistent and consistent person within the body of Christ that I'm called to be. I can't do these things. And I want to tell you, you can by the power of the Lord God. You can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's not by your might, not by your power, but by His Spirit. You can fulfill the calling that God has laid out before you. You can do what He's called you to do. Why? Because he's with you. And as a new covenant Christian, you know he's in you. You know, it's interesting when you think about the Lord encouraging the people by referring back to the old covenant. Basically saying to the people, remember the covenant that I made with you? Well, I'm still in covenant with you and my spirit remains with you. Think about how much more we ought to be encouraged in light of the new covenant. It's as though the Lord would tell his new covenant people, I'm in covenant with you. I have ratified that covenant by my blood. The father would say by the blood of my son. The son would say by my own blood. It's a new covenant. It's with better promises. You have a better priesthood. You have a better offering. You have better promises. I'm abiding with you. You go and do the work. You are in covenant with me. You're in union with me. I'm yours and you're mine forever. Now go and do the work I've called you to do. And I will empower you to accomplish it. I will empower you to do it. Third, If you were to look at Haggai chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, kind of all together, you'll see what the people were thinking, at least in measure, and you'll see what God would say to them in response, at least the beginning of his response. And in light of that, I think Alec Alec Moitier's counsel is well said. So this is another bit of application as to how you could stay encouraged and do the work of the Lord even when you feel discouraged. Uh, Alec Moitier said, the key to tackling despondency is found here. Stop listening to ourselves and start listening to him and his word of promise. And that's it, right? Verse 3, you're looking at this temple, you think it's nothing. You're creating all reasons why you should be discouraged. Well, stop listening to yourself. Because some of us, right, we could be really good at that. You could prosecute yourself, say, I'm going to make a case for discouragement. And you need to just say, I'm going to hit the mute button on myself. I don't want to hear my voice make the case as to why I ought to be discouraged. I'd rather hear God's word tell me why I ought to be encouraged and be about what he's called me to be about. Oh, may it happen for you, son or daughter of God. And finally, but this is for next week. Finally, and I find this of great encouragement. I'm very excited, Lord willing, for next week's message. Similar to the builders of Haggai's day, when you undertake what you're doing for the work of the Lord, you are participating in a building process that is far more significant than what you realize. The ripple effects of it, doubtless, are tremendous. But you lack the vantage point of the future and you lack the vantage point of God, so you have to hear his word and you have to trust that your labor is not in vain and that God will take your little and multiply it much even as he was doing for those people in that day. With that said, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we ask, Lord, that you might uh, encourage us, encourage your people, even as we, by your grace, seek to heed the exhortations found for us in the book of the prophet Haggai to um, set our priorities aright, to build our lives around you. Father, you know our frames. You know that we're but dust. You know that we are prone to discouragement and dispiritedness and despondency. 
And I pray, Heavenly Father, that by your word, even this day, you might find us, Lord, not making unhealthy comparisons with the past that make our present work seem insignificant, that you might help us, Heavenly Father, not to keep listening to the case that we would make against ourselves so as to discourage ourselves, but that we might hear your voice, as it were, saying, be courageous, be strong, take courage and work, for I am with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that your spirit is um, not only among us, but your spirit has taken up residence inside of us. And we pray that not by our might, nor by our power, but by your Holy Spirit, that we might, even amidst times of discouragement, grow in the grace of not um, growing weary. And even when we do grow weary, waiting on you to renew our strength, and by your grace being steadfast and immovable and abounding in your work, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Father, I pray that as we seek to do this, that you would keep reminding us by your Spirit of this new covenant that we are in, of the blood that was shed for us, of the sins that have been forgiven through Christ, of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit and the ever-present access we have to you. Hallelujah. In light of such precious promises, may you find us encouraged and may you find us, Heavenly Father, being about your business, occupying till your Son comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.